At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeff Collier. Uh, he, Dr. Collier is a plastic surgeon who currently serves as a Kansas State representative. Dr. Collier has extensive experience in both domestic and international disaster medical response, including war zones, bioterrorism, and mass casualty events. Dr. Collier will address the plight of the forgotten. Dr. Jeff Collier. Has everybody had their coffee this morning? We're going to try to uh, keep you awake. But I know you're awake because you're here, and you're here for a reason. And this is a great opportunity that I didn't have and some of the other folks in this room never had. I first got interested in international affairs when I was a, a kid in high school in western Kansas, of all places. And we happened to be in Portugal uh, when I was a teenager visiting, and there was uh, Angola was a colony of Portugal, and they were breaking up, and they were actually flying a number of refugees into Portugal at the time, and it happened to be that the pilots of a couple of these planes were staying at the hotel where we were. And that was my first kind of inclination of, wow, what is this? Uh, what's, what's going on? Well, I got interested more and more in, in these sorts of things and uh, uh, decided that I wanted to participate because I believed in service, believed that we can all make a difference. Now what I've learned is that there's time that's involved. And when time gets involved, your perspectives change a little bit and you learn some lessons. And I'm going to hopefully share some of my lessons and I'm hopefully going to learn some of your lessons. But the biggest thing is, when I started doing this, this didn't exist. And if you will go and if someday somebody ever really writes the true history of assisting other people in the last 25 years, the revolution that has taken place is unbelievable. And that revolution comes from people that are committed, like you, who start using their brains to think through how are we going to solve this problem? You know, we have Nicholas, we have Gary, we have a number of people. We're now starting to formalize these things, and it is making a tremendous difference in terms of the effectiveness, in terms of the lives saved, in terms of our own personal lives and our own personal values. Um, I have lost my flipper. Where is... Oh, here we go. I wanted to visit with you about how I kind of got started uh, in this and give you some of my own personal experiences. I first volunteered in 1985, in December of 1985. I was a medical student here in town. And I was very interested in what was going on in Afghanistan. At that time, the Soviet Union had invaded a couple of years before. Uh, Almost a million people had died in that conflict. There were six million refugees. Uh, there was a geopolitical contest. And uh, I was very interested in it. And I started learning about who are the people that uh, are involved in these conflicts. And it really, as I now kind of look into perspective, it is the forgotten that they're after. It is the forgotten that are really the people that suffer in this. A lot of times we tend to think of it as an organized war, um, you know, soldiers in uniform. And then we start thinking a little bit about civil wars. But really, we've had all of those things going on for millennia. We have terrorism, which may be single individual events. This is uh, Peshawar in, uh, in January of 1986. Kind of looks familiar uh, to today. This was uh, an explosion just down the road from us. But civil strife has existed in many of these countries. And then we'll have isolated incidents, and then we now look at that specter of WMDs. Oops. Well, I think that this kind of exists in a spectrum. Uh, and what we started to really see in the second half of the 20th century is we started to see more of targeting of civilians of the forgotten 
and using that as the political tool in order to d get whatever means, political means, people wanted. In the second half of the 20th century, more than 20 million civilians outside of the declared world wars and, and the other wars, about 20 million people uh, died. And what happens is these kind of, there's actually a spectrum uh, that exists. Um, for example, in Rwanda, I was the uh, only surgeon in southern Rwanda in the summer of 1994. And this is the, one of the roads. And as you drive down the road, you're looking and, you know, it's a normal highway. It looks great. And then you would come up to an area and you would see these clothes and bags just kind of stashed along the side of the road and just dropped hurriedly. And what had happened was the ordinary individuals, you know, we had a war going on. We had a conflict. And what did they do? They picked up their kids and their stuff and they got on the road and they started walking and trying to get out of the country. Well, the Interhamway showed up and you know the rest of the story and you know why those bags are, are sitting there. But what happens is you will sometimes have these individual small isolated incidents. And what they do is they can aggregate. And when they aggregate, that is when you get to genocide. And there is an actual timeline and a continuum that goes on from them. Now, these things have been happening from time immemorial. Kansas and Missouri, we had terrorism and we had a civil war that our two states were a part of. We saw this in the Jewish war. If you go in, back and you read Flavius Josephus, you can see many of the same tactics and same, many of the same events probably not as targeted on civilians as recorded. We don't know for sure uh, on that. We see it in Cortez. We see it in, here in this country. Um, but we've really seen it in every country, and it's involved individuals and organizations. And so, for example, this picture that you're looking at here, that was a village in Afghanistan that the Soviets just decided to obliterate. And they literally, the only thing standing are just a few foundation walls. You can also recall that's what happened to Jerusalem. Uh, and we have the Wailing Wall as the only remnant of it. So what is the goal? What are they trying to do with this? It's not that we're just normally trying to hurt one particular individual. What the idea is is that you're trying to destroy the fabric of society those interwoven links that exist in this. You want to go after families and clans and connections and business interests and the restaurants and the churches. What you're trying to do is change daily life so that you can create this chaos in order to achieve whatever goal this other side is. And then sometimes it just gets completely out of hand and it it metastasizes and just keeps growing and growing. And it is this chaos, it is when the chaos exists that you start to see genocide. When everything is completely broken down, the family units are broken down, where we're dividing them on racial lines or tribal lines, or we find out that the local church, you know, that you separate people in the church uh, there, it is trying to create that chaos. And when that chaos gets so crazy, that's when the unbelievable happens. And so we've got to go and look at how do we deal with the chaos that is on. And that is truthfully what all of us in this room are starting to deal with, is how do we prevent the chaos? How do we get to resolve? You know, in a, in a place, um, that's a Balkans one, I believe. Um, you know, one of the things that you would do is you will target their families. You will target houses. And so you can drive down a road and various families will just have a couple of, you know, uh, howitzer shells or something just dumped in there, just trying to blow up in an individual house, send a message, try to create that chaos. In Rwanda, I think this is something that really is different. And 
These are the true dogs of war that she saw. And, and this is an example of when chaos happens completely. This is a country of about 8 million people. Smaller, it's about the size of the eastern third of Kansas. So it's a very densely packed uh, country. In the space of about four or five months, we lost almost a million people uh, in that time frame. Internally displaced, people that were packing up were moving over to hills and, and just trying to get away from it was two and a half million people. Another two and a half million actually made it over the border and we would call them refugees in, the, in that neighboring country. And so if you sit there and you're thinking about this, you know, this is 80% of the population was either killed or moved out of their home in a matter of weeks uh, that, that this happened. And you would get these horrible things that, that happened. And fortunately, you can't see the detail of, of this hill. But this, uh, if you would go and look closer and on down this hill, we had about 1,000 people that had gathered together trying to escape the interhomway. They went and hid uh, on one side of the hill. They're camping out. And, and actually, they were camping out you know, in kind of a, a big open area. It's on the side of the hill, and you can actually see the pots and pans and everything. And what happened was some of the soldiers came over the top of the hill, forced everyone down to the bottom, and you know the rest of that story. And that's why all the houses were empty and the dogs were fat. What do you do? In Rwanda, those people were forgotten. How did they do it? Now, Rwanda was kind of a little bit different. Most of the deaths in any of these conflicts, most of the deaths are actually non-violent deaths. There would be mines that get involved, and mines are something that's set to control where people move. It's not that you're supposed to blow you up. It's to make you go in a certain place or stay out of a certain place. And then they can do with it there. But what was very interesting in Rwanda is people improvised. We're seeing the IEDs in Afghanistan. But in Rwanda, they used what the farm implements that they use every day. You were harvesting matoki, a form of bananas uh, there. And you were using a machete and a hoe. And that's what much of the killing that actually happened was done a very close range uh, in Rwanda. But for the forgotten, we, can, we kind of know that story. But the ones who are forgotten are those who get displaced and they, lo they lose their food supply or they lose their basic family unit, which is really the source of their medical care. And so what happens is they get susceptible and the number one killer in conflicts is not bullets, it's diarrhea. The number one killer in conflicts is diarrhea. And that is because it is these kids that get caught uh, in the middle of it. You get unsafe water, you're moving around, these kids are on the edge already. You get these kids that are displaced in Sudan, and you know what can happen then. They get that, they're more susceptible to uh, pneumonias. Um, the chronic illnesses that may exist underneath uh, suddenly get exasperated there. And then sometimes we see those weapons of convenience. And so when this happens, it has all sorts of social effects too because they're trying to destroy the fabric of the society. And so you will go and you'll target the health systems. And so this pharmacy uh, here, that's what's left. You want to, the looting is actually something that may be a targeting mechanism or it may be a coping strategy uh, on it, but it starts bringing chaos uh, to folks. And then when you start breaking this up, then you start breaking up governments and you break up the local economics uh, of a place. You go after the churches, you go after the clans. And so in a place like Rwanda, where everything was wrong, everything fell apart, you could suddenly start to see little pieces of the world come back together again. After we went in uh, to Rwanda and we had been there a few weeks, you, you know what that story was. But the most amazing story 
that you don't know is that after we got there and we were working near this hospital, one day a little shack appeared right by our house. It's on the road. We were probably the safest place around. And in that shack, somebody started selling something. And they had salt, sugar, a little bit of flour, and one pair of size 9 Nikes uh, in there. And from that little shack, you started to see the economy start to come together again. People started returning to their homes. They could get a little bit of salt. It was expensive, but they could start getting things and they could start trading and then things would start to come together again. And then you know, the world would start to fit in. But then you still have that psychological aspect of it. And you know, we've all kind of heard of PTSD. It's a really sexy topic uh, for us. But the real victims of PTSD are the, are the forgotten. We forget that those families that were there that got displaced, that they may have some form of it. But then it's not only just the forgotten, it's also the responders. It may be you guys, or me, or any of us in this room that can do that. It is the leaders of some of these organizations or some of the governments that are there. And in fact, if you think about how some organizations and perhaps even how some countries behave in the aftermath of a disaster, you can get whole communities and perhaps even a country to behave as if they have PTSD. They can't focus. They can't coordinate and process information. Think about some of the responses to Katrina. Some of those are almost a PTSD type of response uh, for some of the people uh, that were affected uh, in it and for some of the leaders. Think about what happens to what, the issues that we have to deal with the New York firefighters. They all had PTSD. These are wonderful folks, but we're going to have to deal with them. And so it has all sorts of social effects that may be long lasting that we don't truly understand their full implications these days. And then who else do we see in these? It's the kids. It's the kids that are forgotten. Now, we like to think we're here to help the kids, and I believe we probably are. But they don't have connections the way some of the others do. They certainly don't have a job. And many of them, they lose their schooling there, so they have no, plan, no way to socialize or to get into a safe place. Then these kids start losing you know, whatever access to any sort of medical care there is. And then we have places like Sierra Leone, where child soldiers and child slaves uh, are very common. And what happens uh, with these is it's really kind of part of that dogs of war. These kids have nothing except maybe there's some soldiers around them. And what happens is those soldiers will say, you know what, we can get you a little bit of food. Come, you've got to carry all of my stuff, my backpacks, the spoils. We, we need you to go and work and do something uh, for us. And they get them a little bit of food. And before long, they sit there and they carve RUF across their forehead so that they're marked permanently. They stand for the Revolutionary United Front. And that was a, a, a tactic that they used. And you would end up with these kids now are, are stuck and they're indentured now. They can't escape. They've got this billboard on their, on their face. And then what happens with them is they become either a slave or they become cannon fodder. Not a true soldier. They become cannon fodder. You have to go and, and do this. Or we may even force you to go and attack your own family. Or the family won't accept them because they've got to defend themselves. If they have this kid that has RUF carved around, what are the neighbors going to think? And you know what they would think? They'd be scared out of their mind. And then these children also you know, are victims. You, know, you can try to target them. And then there are kids that are heroes. This little girl lost all of her family. She's probably eight uh, or so. Um, and uh, yeah, she ended up, she had an old broken wrist fracture that had, had him healed with a malunion uh, on it. But what she did was she brought her six-year-old brother and her three-year-old uh, sister as well. 
and brought them along and somehow got them to Peshawar or to the outskirts of uh, Peshawar in Afghanistan. Um, you know, these are people, these kids do heroic things and we need to help them. You know, we need to help them trace their families, get them to medical care. It's amazing how many of these kids adopt and, and in every conflict that I've been in, I've run into these kids and it really just kind of changes your life forever. Well, those terrorist methods, you know, that they were looking at, they're going after the kids, trying to create PDSE, all of this, they're trying to target they're trying to target the forgotten because that's the forgotten are the fabric of society. And so you'll do that the simple ways with guns, explosives, but a lot more what we really see and which is really terrifying is there's a lot more hostage taking than anybody really cares to admit. There's a lot more very targeted killings, not maybe for political reasons, but maybe for economic reasons. Guy who happens to own that little shop that opened up uh, down the street and you always wanted to buy something there and they might target him. They may use those weapons of convenience but now you know we're starting to think a little bit more of the exotic weapons and the targeting of women and children. And then when they target what happens is you start blowing up the healthcare system because what happens then is you know we may have a tent and a lot of you have seen these sorts of things. We're probably not too proud, you know, that, hey, this, you know, we've got this big mass of people. We really want to register them and get it done properly. But in many of these systems, you can't do that. The triage system gets completely bypassed. Uh, or you may get this temporary deluge of, of people and it'll overwhelm uh, the specialists or, or the medical providers that are in that country. Other people kind of get remember, you know, they get reminded, say, oh, gosh, I had this ache in my hip, you know, here, maybe I really should go see the doctor since we happen to have one, you know, around or, a, you know, some sort of assistant uh, there. And we see these walk wounded. And so this healthcare system gets deluged both from inside and from out. Well, when I've looked at this, I've been starting to look uh, a little bit more at some of the lessons that we can learn on what happens, particularly in, in a terrorist-related uh, type of incident. The truth is, just like Haiti, you know, it's the search and rescue is the locals um, that are first. And really that first 48, 72 hours, it's all whatever is there uh, that happens. But now what we're starting to see is we're now starting to see more targeting of, res of responders. And in fact, uh, several times in Britain, if you are, uh, much of the training in Britain for the medical community is if a bomb goes off outside your building, don't walk out and try to do something to help the victims. Wait five or ten minutes because many times there is a secondary bomb and we found this throughout, uh, we found this throughout London, Paris, uh, and much of those. Interestingly, the New York Times Square bomber didn't have that level of sophistication. Uh, on this. But then when this happens and you start seeing the transportation system gets overwhelmed. And another thing that we often see and something that we have an impact on is we'll also see a lot of times those responses may be inappropriate. We may try to send tons and tons of baby clothes uh, you know, to a place when really what they need is some transportation, they need some money so that they can start getting that economy. Uh, moving once again. There are different types of WMDs and that and we do need to start talking about these um, there but really you know many of these exotic things they may be limited because of some of the characteristics of them but they are certainly very very scary. What it, and, but if you get a WMD what is the impact of it? Part of it is they're trying to kill a lot of people, but it does some other things politically and also environmentally and economically and is part of that chaos theory. You know, when you, if we do see one of these things, what do we see? We're going to see it everywhere. All of us are going to be aware of that. And that is a big goal of these folks. We're going to have all sorts of other problems. National security decisions will trump some of the
casualty care issues and, and things uh, like that. And that is going to be a very, very tough decision uh, if we see that. Um, the targets, they're going to try to attack more children, oftentimes not in this country, but we're seeing it in many other uh, industrial countries targeting kids or the medical system there. Then what happens though in this situation, it's going to be a different type of response. Local control, the local officials, they're going to lose a lot of their control in that decision making process. And the local control of the health services is going to be confused uh, at best. And whatever happens in these, we aren't going to have a perfect response and it will have to be criticized, uh, and it will be criticized uh, no matter what, even if we do a good job. Well, what are some of the natural disasters that are out there? Hurricanes, tsunamis, uh, you know, earthquakes, very exotic disasters. There was a lake uh, in uh, the southern part of Africa that happens to be in a volcano, and it had a little methane that uh, blew up as a bubble. And one night that bubble came to the surface and the report, I, I was a White House fellow, I was in, at the State Department at the time, I got this message, you know, of we have about a thousand or two thousand people that are just dead in their beds, they haven't moved. You know, what is this? And, what it, and it took a number of days to figure out, but it was actually this methane bubble popped up and suffocated uh, everyone. You, there are these odd exotic uh, disasters uh, that require some unique lessons. Um, probably one of the most important disaster lessons actually came from Armenia, which is an earthquake uh, from December 7, 1988, but really colors most of our disaster responses today. This was in the uh, Soviet Union. It was still the Soviet Union at the time. They had lots of towers. There are 75 towers that had more than 20 stories in them. And they were old Soviet era uh, type things and they just pancaked to down on top of each other. We had about 75,000 people that were killed uh, in that earthquake. And one of the things that happened was it was the first time that the Soviets actually allowed international teams to, to come in. Uh, and I was fortunate to be a part of that. Um, but really what happened is when the international teams came in, they had to rely on local resources, transportation. How do you get from the airport out to the field? How do you start doing, how do we start dealing with some of the healthcare uh, stuff? What happens with the PTSD and it really started to become an issue and, and some of the secondary effects? And this was probably one of the places where we saw one of the most inappropriate sets of donations you know, that would come in of just tons and tons of summer clothes in a place uh, where we had an earthquake and we had a matter, in a matter of a couple of days, we had about 20 inches of snow and about 400,000 people out in the middle of it. And then we, and on top of this, we had a conflict. We had an Armenian-Azerbaijan semi-civil war, civil strife uh, going on and some of the relief workers got involved in, in this and et cetera. But probably the biggest lesson uh, was from a guy named Fred Cuny. And Fred is a, is a hero. Uh, fortunately, he was murdered uh, in Ingushetia um, a few years ago. Um, he's the only person who became a MacArthur Fellow posthumously. Um, and what Fred did, um, I, I spent a lot of time with him on, on, on this particular trip. What we were looking at is one of the first things you often do is you'll distribute plastic sheeting uh, to people. And you can, make, you can do wonderful things with plastic sheeting. You can you know, cover up a window, you can make a tent out of it, you can wrap it around people and keep them warm. Uh, it's wonderful stuff. So we're bringing out all this plastic sheeting and we noticed what the locals were doing was they were building lean-tos for their cattle. And you know, they weren't putting it on, on the buildings there, but people were congregating in buildings and stuff, but they were using it on, on their cattle. And um, as we're reporting back, you know, back to the State Department, you know, here's what's going on with this. 
they said, well, we're not going to send any more of that. You know, that, you know, they're not helping people. But what was happening was we had a local coping strategy and they knew what was their one asset that they had to get through for the next year. It was their cattle, their livestock there. And if they lost those, everything is lost. And Fred was one of these people that could recognize some of these local ingenuity, you know, and start following them. You know, we, we've learned uh, about a lot of these disasters, and there was a study uh, about disasters likely to hit the United States, and this was by the National Academy of Sciences. In 2000, they said our most likely disasters are going to be terrorism. We saw that in 2001. A New Orleans flood was number two. San, San Andreas earthquake, haven't quite uh, been there. We have, and epidemics, uh, specifically a flu uh, epidemic, and we've been close, but not quite uh, there. That's a pretty scary uh, uh, prediction. You know, we also see um, these discussions of famine as part of the uh, problem of the forgotten and, and these disasters. And the forgotten in famine are really kind of the big group. And the reason that they're forgotten is because of the economics on this. Uh, there's an Indian named Amartya Sen, um, and he actually went and he looked back in India, and he's looked at a number of other countries about when people were dying uh, in famine, where was the food? And in fact, in many countries, in most countries, there's actually enough food in the region or in the country uh, to actually feed everybody. But the problem is the price of food has gone through the roof and it becomes an economic uh, phenomena uh, in there. And so one of the things that Fred Cooney did, for example, was in Ethiopia and Eritrea during the, during the Civil War, there was, there, we had a famine that we were dealing with, we actually, but there was actually enough food over on the Eritrean side uh, that you could feed over onto the Ethiopian side. They literally, rather than sending people, what you had to do is just go and buy the food and move it across, uh, you know, there. And then one of the things that you could do, though, is you could actually even manipulate the price of food uh, a little bit uh, so that you can make it more affordable uh, for people so that when they lose their reserves or anything, they can, they can deal with it. They can have a coping strategy. And so when you face some of these sorts of phenomena, people do things. And let's kind of look back in our recent history here in the United States in the last year. You know, we're all a lot poorer than we were five years ago. And everybody has made, there are all sorts of little coping strategies. Prices have gone up on some things. We've raised taxes on some things. We've cut uh, a bunch of programs. We're coping. You know, we don't go on as nice a trips as we used to go on. You know, maybe you don't go to the movies, uh, you know, quite as often or eat out as often. And when you're looking at a situation of famine, that's really kind of an economic phenomenon too. And so what happens is people will start to consolidate. It may send the kid off to the city to go work, try to get some extra money. Um, if that's not enough, then what else do you try to do? Well, we can't bring in more money, then we'll start selling stuff. And before long, you know, you sell your wife's jewelry, and then you sell something else and something else. And finally, the last thing you have is your livestock, you know, which is really your one golden asset, which can reproduce. You end up having to sell that, then you have to walk. There isn't a whole lot of alternative. Uh, after that point. And so when we're looking at these problems, you got to look at these coping strategies that normal people do and come up with your interventions at that time. There have been a lot of disasters since uh, 1985 to the last uh, 25 years of, of all varieties in, in lots of countries, but they don't always break up a healthcare system. These disasters are not full medical disasters, and some disasters didn't happen. You know, we had an entire empire, the USSR, broke up uh, without a giant civil war. We had some minor civil wars. We broke up Czechoslovakia, uh, which are now part of the EU. Very rare for a country to break up, but they did these things without overwhelming their healthcare systems. 
Also, when the World Trade Center collapsed, we had plenty of health care available you know, in the region there. Um, many of the earthquakes, or South Africa, others, and even in Iraq, we actually had a lot of things that didn't devastate these national medical systems, unlike some of the other ones. And so we have to think about, when we're working in these places, how are we going to be a part of that medical system? What is the difference for the forgotten in the third world and the first world? In the third world, infection, diarrhea, tends to be the thing that you're most susceptible to and can be the killer. In the first world, it may be diabetic, elderly, chronic illnesses are more susceptible. PTSD exists in, in both areas. Probably in the third world, the direct violence is not the killer, but in the United States, I think World Trade Center, direct violence was the killer uh, there. And that's part of the economics, part of the fabric of that society that allows us to do that. In much of the third world, you know, there is lack of both specialty and primary care. In the United States or in France or Ireland, uh, when there are disasters, the number one uh, specialty that gets overused is plastic surgery. It's the most common uh, uh, referral and, and where you have the biggest shortages, but you need them only for a short time uh, there. In the third world, everybody is in place. In the first world, you can move people out uh, and you can do that efficiently. Humanitarian assistance is now a big deal. It is a strategic issue in the national interest, something that didn't exist until about 1985 with Ronald Reagan. Um, we're now starting to see some of these largest relief programs in history um, uh, there. But it gets really complicated. We have UN, federal, state, local NGOs, uh, and we also get a lot of people that just get plain tired of having to deal with these disasters. Well, who are these NGOs? Well, a lot of them are here today, and I am so proud uh, of them because they've come so far. There are a lot of local organizations that exist in any one of these countries, and hooking up with them is vitally important. There's a lot of U.S. well-known organizations, International Medical Corps, Mercy Corps, SAVE, international organizations like the Red Cross. Um, there are some that I call mom and pop groups, which just kind of spontaneously grow up. Uh, there, there are also a number of religious groups uh, that happen. But these NGOs that come in all varieties and stripes and effectiveness. And they're certainly becoming much more effective. But in the end, they're going to re re rely on the local providers. It's where you're ultimately going to have your best impact. And those local providers are different than ours. You know, the most common thing to see will be social workers and medical assistants. And when somebody has that respiratory pneumonia or your kid has diarrhea, they don't go see the doctor. They go to the pharmacy store uh, down there, and, and it's a pharmacy assistant that uh, actually gives them the ORS uh, for their kids uh, diarrhea or maybe gives them clindamycin for their pneumonia. Uh, it's, it's a little different uh, system depending on, on where you are. We certainly have midwives and nurses and physicians uh, in many of these uh, uh, countries as well. But then when we have these disasters happening, we get all sorts of outside providers. We just saw this in Haiti. Um, Sometimes it's, you know, some guy who happens to be around there and is kind of doing something new. We now have a vast core of disaster professionals that really didn't exist 20 years ago. But we also have a lot of well-intentioned people but no experience. Fortunately, we have courses like this to train people. We have adventurers. I was probably an adventurer when I started. Uh, you have people that may have resources. They can donate. They have money. They want to do something. I have some people that just want to show up with a TV camera. And then we have people that, oh, you know, I'm just there for a week or two, but it's the people that make those long-term commitments that are really the best ones. And in all of this, though, it really seems to be, particularly in war zones, is we tend to see about 60 70% women. Today, uh, that's probably about the same percentage here uh, on that. So uh, when they say women aren't the, the tougher part, I'll take, you to, I'll take you to any conflict in the world, and it is more women than men. 
the international providers, when we go, I think we do have some responsibilities and we have some thoughts on where we should go. I mean, we need to get their system that they have working again. We need to use the local system and, and help fix that. So we can help with facilities, supplies, logistics, the technology. There may be some unusual things that we may have to uh, help with, but usually the last of them is direct patient care in these disasters. Many of these international teams now have a pretty sophisticated organization uh, you will have a country director who's looking at the overall program, medical directors. Logistics is really the giant thing. How do you get across the border? How do you get from Jordan to Iraq or Kuwait to Iraq? Um, we have nursing and allied health who are probably doing the bulk of the medical care uh, and a fewer, uh, fewer uh, physicians involved. These NGOs get their money from all sorts of places. We have the Agency for International Development and the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, Refugee Assistance, uh, their UN organizations, EU. There's oftentimes a contributions uh, that really power the smaller organizations. Um, but many of these organizations don't have any ready cash. So when you're starting up in Haiti, they may not have money to actually go and get the first team there. And so there's going to have to be some sort of investment uh, that's there. And then once they're there, they may end up with contracting for specific projects with AID. And in the end, two years later, there's going to be an auditor that trails them. And you've got to think about that on your very first day that you enter into a country. NGOs, now we now have to deal with the military. And uh, we have to deal with them more and more. Many times, the contracts that you might have with the EU or something, they'll say you cannot participates in or ride in a military vehicle. Sometimes there's outright antagonism uh, between the NGOs and the military. But now we're starting to see more and more respect uh, and some, at least some working that goes on. But there is a necessity. You've got to share. They have to know where you are. There's security issues. You are a target uh, now. Transportation and communications are controlled by militaries, and so they do know where you are, and you're going to have to deal with them. And then there's this other thing since, uh, you know, people are people, interaction happens. Uh, people intermingle, you know, relationships form, people get married even in, in these things. Uh, but the military also is one of the few places where you can get truly accurate maps of what's going on. And that military and the NGOs need to talk to each other and tell, you know, the military may not understand that, you know, hey, I'm working in this village and we can provide some food there. You know, they think you can do everything, we'll forget about you and, you know, you need transportation or comms or, or something else uh, there. And so meeting these expectations, uh, we've got to interact. Now we're in a world where neutrality doesn't exist. Uh, I was in Iraq during the invasion. There were three organizations that were actively in Iraq during the initial hostilities. Two of our three organizations that were there had people kidnapped or killed. Um, you know, we all know some of the stories of, of NGO um, that have had somebody killed or kidnapped. And they're not happening just in conflict zones. We're starting to see them in smaller civil strife areas uh, and elsewhere. Um, the military has to deal with it too because they may have to rescue you uh, on that. Or we have the media issues that uh, suddenly explode. But these are very bad realities. That's actually a sniper's the very top there. He would shoot over this berm uh, at us um, there. You know, we now have that specter and the concern of WMDs, you know, and, you know, in a place, uh, you know, if they really do exist in a, in a place. What would you do with your NGO, you know, if there really was smallpox uh, there? What if there is a mass casualty situation and there are soldiers that are involved? Would your NGO treat American soldiers? The American soldiers would certainly treat you uh, on that. Could they transport these patients? I mean, these are all really difficult questions uh, for NGOs. These teams also face not only these military questions, but their problems, okay? Logistics is always lagging uh, in these countries. Um, you lack cash. Security is always a problem. 
language is usually a problem. What is the technology? What's going on locally there? You're going to have to go and assess that disaster. And what I want is I want your most experienced top flight person who has done everything making that assessment. I want them assessing first. I want them triaging second. And finally, treating patients third. We've got to figure out what's going on in those first couple of days. But you, you can do that pretty quickly. There's a rapid assessment. We can post that information. There are now whole systems that are evolving uh, on this uh, there. And then when you're doing that, you're going to look at those coping strategies, just what we were talking about with Fred Cuny. Uh, and those coping strategies may be a little bit different than what the local uh, disaster managers have. And then you'll go and you'll look at that coping strategy and you'll see these kids out here and you'll deal with it and say, ooh, why does that scare the living daylights out of me? And that's because I have that young man grabbing a bucket of water out of that, that pool, but it's also the local swimming hole. And I know what he's going to do with that water. He's going to drink it. And that was, that's his coping strategy. And then, so now how do you do, what do we have to do? Do we have to control the swimming hole? Do we have to control the water? Or do we have to put somebody there with a bucket that has chlorine and he can put a little dollop of uh, you know, a chlorine pellet or something uh, in it as it comes through? You can go you know, places of, you know, like Baghdad and you see these uh, you know, windstorms that, that come across. Um, and you'll get confused. You'll get lost in them. You know, even though you have all of these uh, oil fires, uh, you have to rely on Garmin from Olathe to get you around there. But in many of these countries like Iraq, all of the maps were wrong. They were off by about two miles. And so when you're using your, your Garmin, you're actually driving in the middle of the desert and you see the highway over about two miles uh, there. But it, but it was intentionally so. They, actually, the GPS system was set up uh, that way and the military knew what all the codes were. Um, here. And then everything is gonna go wrong, even like the slide goes wrong, you know. <laughs> This is, you know, one of our very first days going into Iraq. I mean, we weren't even 20 miles in, and we already have a flat tire. And then you got to go and you dig it out uh, there. And then you'll get this surprise, and conflict can erupt anywhere, you know, uh, without any warning. And it may not be good guys and bad guys. It may just be bad guys versus bad guys. But then in the end, when you get there, you're there for the forgotten. And they're all forgotten except by the dogs of the war. And it's these vulnerable kids while, while you're there. You gotta keep safe and you gotta be professional on it. And I have a whole talk about how to keep safe in that, but what I tell you is don't do this unless you've done it. Don't do it unless you've done it. You gotta have real professionals because this world is extremely dangerous uh, in there. It's also very rewarding. It's, when it's the last time you saved 100 lives in a day, but then you may also have those bullet holes uh, over your head uh, there as well. But when you go into one of these disasters, you'll look and you'll see these hospitals. You know, you'll see two people in every bed uh, there, and you're going to have to try to figure out, what am I going to do with this? What's the priority? How am I going to help these folks? Uh, and then we're going to deal with you know, the military in, in these things. Um, I want to kind of finish on a little area here. I think I'm running over just a second. I'm sorry. Um, but forgotten and remembering is really important. You know, in, in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, when it, after it became independent, it kind of collapsed. And the Soviets, when they invaded, there was a lot of geopolitical stuff, but it was also the collapse of a country um, there. The United States got involved in the early 80s and then we forgot. We left uh, there and it soon became America's nightmare. But now I think we're remembering and we're going to have to figure out that we have a long-term commitment in a place there and it's going to be very difficult and very long. And Because it's, it's a very difficult country and not only is it mountainous, but it's a place about the size of Texas, a little smaller, has 25 million people. But if you think about those 25 million people, the average age right now is 47, okay? There is less than 10% of the population that was born before there was a civil war in that country. And so think about PTSD, think about all the coping strategies, think of all this stuff. 
it's an entirely different problem, an incredible one. You know, these Afghans, you know, we have Pashto and, and Hazara. We have to deal with the Taliban and, um, and various clan leaders. And we have to, uh, you know, understand that, you know, Islam and modernity, as my friend Olivier Waugh in Paris used to say, Islam and, and modernity are compatible and they're incompatible. And how do we deal with that? And, and you know, dealing with not only just Taliban and, and it's not one great monolithic Muslim religion. Uh, it has lots of, of different strands and subtleties of any great culture um, there. We have very limited facilities in these places, and then we are also now getting some of the most modern uh, facilities are, are developing uh, there. Many times we have to go and create medics, and many of the medics that we were creating in the late 1980s are now the retiring doctors of today. Uh, there. But in the end, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get from chaos to order. And these NGOs, our organizations, are a big part of restoring that order. So how do you do it? You paint the walls. When I went to Rwanda, um, we ended up at a hospital in a place called Kabungo. And this was really the worst of the worst. And there was a hospital there, and it had a couple of rooms, actually about the size of this room uh, here, from a, on forward here. And there were probably about 200 or so people that were kind of crowded in, and this is where they were sleeping at night, because you could hear what was going on outside. And when you go and you do this, I mean, everybody is so stressed, and they're so fearful, and you know, yeah, some of them are sick and they're the walking wounded, but they're there and they're, they've lost everything. They've lost control. So what do you do? What do you do with genocide? You paint the walls. And you look at me and you say, Jeff, you are crazy. No. One of the very first things you do is you actually give somebody a bucket of paint and you do that Tom Sawyer thing. You actually have to do a little bit of the painting yourself. And then what we would see is we would see people starting to take control of their lives. We actually got that room to paint the walls. And before long, you could start seeing people not crowding in so much uh, at night. And then you start seeing the development of things going on out there. We could actually get real health care started there. You saw that little shack open up outside of our office there, and you start seeing people come back. And then at night, the gunshots would get quiet, and you could sleep. That's what you do. You're taking control and getting rid of the chaos. And so when you're thinking about the forgotten, when you're thinking about how to help them, it is how do they take control of their future because we should never forget. Thank you very much. We're going to have to move along. Uh,